Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullah. So firstly, I hope you're all doing well, inshallah. But more importantly, uh, I hope you're awake because uh, tonight we have a very special guest uh, discussing a very important uh, topic. So before I uh, hand it over to Ustad Amjad, uh, I see a few new faces here. So what I'm going to do is I'll quickly give a quick overview with regards to tonight's program. So inshallah, until 2 a.m., uh, Ustad Amjad will speak. And at that point in time, we'll open the floor for a question and answer session. We'll go for around 20 minutes. We'll then take a 10 minute break in case uh, anyone uh, needs to use the washroom and uh, uh, make wudu. And that'll take us till 2.30. So from 2.30 onwards till 3 a.m., we'll have uh, tahajjud prayers. And then from 3 a.m. onwards, we'll have a suhoor followed by uh, Salatul Fajr. So a uh, quick announcement for those of you uh, towards the door, if you can make your way uh, to the left-hand side of the, of the musalla so that when more people come in, there's more space. That would be greatly appreciated. Uh, so last week, alhamdulillah, we had uh, Sheikh Musleh uh, discuss Ramadan and Revelation being a walking Qur'an. The discussion for today's uh, session will focus on uh, repentance. And so inshallah, Ustad Amjad will be, the, the exact topic assigned to him is Ramadan and Tawbah being a walking Qur'an. Ustad Amjad, alhamdulillah, is, uh, he's been a dear friend of mine uh, and mentor for the past two years. I've gotten to know him uh, during my time on campus. I've benefited immensely from his uh, insights um, and for those of you who are not familiar, he is the Muslim chaplain at the University of Toronto and is actually the first full-time uh, Muslim chaplain at a post-secondary institution of higher learning in Canada. And mashallah, he was appointed, I believe, in 2012, if I'm correct. Uh, he, went to, he has an undergraduate degree uh, in literature from the University of Michigan, was admitted into the uh, University of Michigan Law School as well, uh, but actually he took a year off and uh, went to Hadramut uh, in Dar al-Mustafa in Yemen, spent a transformative year. And so when he came back, uh, he decided to have a career change. And so he then enrolled at the Hartford Seminary and uh, was amongst the uh, earlier graduates in the Muslim chaplaincy program there under the leadership of uh, Professor Ingrid Matson. And uh, alhamdulillah, in 2012, he was uh, appointed uh, as the uh, chaplain at UFT uh, and alhamdulillah, the rest is history. So I'm going to hand it over to Ustad. There's two other things uh, you wanna, might want to know about him. He's a massive fan of Lord of the Rings, and uh, he, he's very expensive taste in coffee. So without further, further delay, Ustad Amjad Tarsi. InshaAllah. Those are interesting facts to choose. <laughs> it's not expensive taste. It's good taste in coffee. MashaAllah. Why spend a lot of money on bad coffee? Bismillah rahman rahim I'm just going to hold this because it feels like this is like really official. Here we go. If you don't mind, is that okay? Yeah, yeah bismillah. MashaAllah. Uh, bismillah rahman rahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa afdalu salah wa atamu taslim ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Uh, Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم يا حليم خلقنا بخلق الحلم وحققنا بحقائق العلم الحمد لله It's a great honor to be here with you all in these blessed days of Ramadan and these blessed nights of Ramadan and really to think about the fact that already half of Ramadan has passed that this is the 15th night of Ramadan and if you've been looking at the moon the last couple nights it's full and now the moon is on its way to going back, uh, uh, to waning once again. Uh, and it's a sign that as the moon wanes and becomes smaller, that that door of opportunity also uh, becomes a little bit narrower. It's still broad, but in time it's narrow. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He bless us in these days of Ramadan, that He forgive us in these days of Ramadan, and that He grants us a transformative Ramadan. The topic today is Tawbah, is turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And literally what Tawbah means is a return back, is turning back. That's what it means li literally. But what we mean by it in the language or what we mean by it 
technically in the Sharia is repentance, is turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in repentance. And this is one of the most beautiful and important uh, decisions that we make in our lives. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us this opportunity and there's no better time really than Ramadan when all the gates of paradise are opened and all the gates of the fire are closed that we turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because so many of the, the influences that hold us back are gone in the month of Ramadan. And that it's an opportunity for transformation and transformation really begins with Tawbah. They say that the first step in the path towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the first real step is Tawbah. Why? Because the person is saying, Oh Allah, I want to change my life and I want to change my decisions and the way that I'm doing things in a way that's pleasing to you. And I want to make a long-term and lasting change. And that's really the first steps of Tawbah. And the scholars, they talk about Tawbah. I won't talk about the technical aspects. Maybe we can talk about that in the Q&A. But we'll talk about the verses and the ahadith and we're going to look at a chapter from a beautiful book by Imam al nawawi called Riyad al-Salihin, The Gardens of the Righteous. And he has a chapter on Tawbah, on repentance and seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If not mistaken, what's the full title of the talk? A, a time to come clean with Allah. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful title because that's what Tawbah does. Not only does it clean your slate, but it cleans your soul. And it allows you to really heal from the damage of sin. And it allows us to really become whole once again in our turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم, وَتُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا أَيُّهَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ And we're in Masjid Al-Falah, so we can talk about success and falah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And turn back to Allah entirely, O believers, so that you may be successful. Turn back to Allah entirely, O believers, so that you may be successful. So one of the conditions for success is tawbah is turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I think one of, the most, uh, one of the most refreshing and reassuring things in our religion is the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recognizes and knows because He is our Creator that we are flawed. We are flawed individuals. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's not that you have to be perfect, but it's that you have to try. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us, is to just try. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, turn back, tubu. He doesn't say, never make a mistake again. He says, tubu ilallahi jami'an ayyuhal mu'minuna la'allakum tuflihun. That repent and turn back to Allah entirely, O believers, so that you may be successful. So the first step to spiritual and everlasting success is turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And really, it's a gift from Allah when that happens. And if you feel, and it's one of those things that continuously happens in your life. If someone says, I've made Tawbah, now I'm good, they didn't really get the point. It's a continuous process. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Hud, وَقَالَ تَعَالَى وَأَنِ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ ثُمَّ تُوبُوا إِلَيْهِ Allah says, seek your Lord's forgiveness then turn back to Him in repentance. That there's that verbal, Astaghfirullah, oh Allah, I seek your forgiveness. I want to come clean. I want to make a change. I recognize that I have been allowing my nafs and my ego really rule the things that I do. And now I want to prefer what you want from me over what my own nafs wants for itself. Because especially if someone is reflective, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. But if someone actually goes deep into making mistakes and falling into forbidden things, then they start to realize that it damages the soul. That it weighs down on the soul. That's one of the things that the shaitan works really hard. And frankly, he does a good job of it. May Allah protect us from his tricks. But he makes those things that are actually harmful for you appear pleasant. 
and appear, appear desirable. And I'm going to try that out. But the reality is, is look at those people who've gone deep into that kind of thing and they're damaged. They're hurting. And one of the things I've, you know, worked with a lot of people who've become Muslim and, and embraced Islam, and you see a lot of them say, we went through things and we couldn't find a way out except through turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this beautiful religion of Islam. There's a, a beautiful indigenous brother, his name is uh, David Alexanderson. And he told me, and he tells this story publicly, so it's not a secret, which is why I'm sharing it with you. He tells people about how he became Muslim. And as he was growing up, you know, he grew up, I think, in like 50 different homes. Because he just, they kept bouncing him from home to home to home. And then he got involved in some criminal activities and he got involved in intoxicants until he became an alcoholic. And he said, uh, uh, you know, he actually lost a lot of time and a lot of money uh, and a lot of just his own physical and spiritual and mental health going down that path. And he said, the only way I could become sober was through Islam. And he said, ever since the day I became Muslim, Alhamdulillah, I've been clean. And if you see, it's not like the same as me talking about it, but if you see, you see the fact that he's coming from a place of deep pain and that the source of comfort and serenity and tranquility for him is Islam. So when you make that tawbah, when you turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our Lord and Creator and the one who knows best what is good for us in our lives, then you start to actually have a, a, a sense of healing from the scars. وَقَالَ تَعَالَى يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا تُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ تَوْبَةً نَصُوحًا This is a beautiful verse. O you who believe, repent to Allah and turn back to God, a pure and full repentance. In other words, when you're turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and once again, it's a great gift. When, and a lot of people, they get to that point either in two different ways, either a near-death experience or they hit rock bottom. You find a lot of people, that's, that's why a lot of people become Muslim in prison because it's like everything else, all the doors literally and figuratively have been slammed in my face and I've had the time to actually look, how did I get here and how do I, where do I go from here? And they say, they find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That it is a great gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be able to have your heart come back to life. Because one of the things that happens is the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told us that when a person sins, that there is a dot that appears on their heart. And it's spiritual. You can't see it in an x-ray. You can't see it in open heart surgery. But it's a spiritual dot. It's a removal of iman. It's a removal of the nur, of the light that Allah places in the heart of the believer. So when the person uh, asks Allah for forgiveness, it's cleaned off. But if a person continuously does so, then that dot covers the entire heart until the heart becomes dead. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protection from that. But one of the ways that we bring our heart back to life is asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness and He is the most merciful of the merciful. If you thought of the worst kind of sin that could ever happen, and we as human beings, we don't like to forgive one another. But the reality is, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is forgiving and merciful. If you still have life, you can ask Allah for forgiveness. The worst thing you could possibly think of if a person turns back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're forgiven. And one of the things that the shaitan does to us is that when we do make mistakes, the shaitan whispers to us because he wants us to lose hope. Because if we lose hope, then we just give up. And then, uh, and then it's all over. And someone says, why should I even try? So the shaitan will say to a person when they make a mistake, do you know what you just did? Do you think that you're ever going to be righteous? Do you think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to forgive you? for what you just did. And yes, we feel ashamed, that's healthy, but we should never feel despair. We should never feel despair. If a person feels ashamed, then channel that sense of shame into, I'm never gonna do that again. Channel that sense of shame into, you know what? Tomorrow I'm gonna do better. 
channel it into something say you know what I'm going to make amends with that person that I wronged and harmed and it's never going to happen again and then when you make that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when a person repents that their sins are turned into good deeds look at the generosity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's not only that your sins are forgiven but when you make a sincere repentance and you turn back to Allah and look at the month of Ramadan what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving us that all of the gates of paradise are opened. What does that tell you? It tells you the, the doors are open for opportunity. The doors of mercy are opened. The doors of acceptance are open. The door of dua is open. And all the doors of the hellfire are closed. So that you say, you should have some hope. You should roll up your sleeves and ask of your generous Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that Allah will change even the worst of sins, either forgive them or turn them into good deeds. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet ﷺ to tell the believers, قُلْ يَعِبَادِ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ It's a beautiful ayah. لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Say to my servants who have harmed and wronged their own selves, because this is the thing, I know a lot of young people, they're like, man, Islam is hard. Why do we got all these rules? Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want so much from us? Why do I got to do this and got to do that and got to do the other? And it's 1 a.m. and we're sitting in the mosque in Ramadan. Like, what's this all about? What in reality it's all about is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guiding you to your own benefit and goodness. Someone might say, what does Allah need with my worship? Allah doesn't need anything with your worship. But you need everything with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you are the one who gains. And you are the one who's honored. And you are the one who is elevated through these acts of worship. And you're protected from harm in this world and the hereafter. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ Who have wronged their own selves. Because your soul has a right over you. And the right of your soul over you is not to harm it with sin is not to damage your own heart and soul, is not to uh, uh, you know, put your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in jeopardy. That's your right that you have over your own self. You haven't harmed Allah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't hold a grudge against people. Do not despair of the mercy of Allah. Even if someone commits the most egregious and heinous of crimes, if they want to change, Allah will accept them. If they want to go back and turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept them. Nobody can say otherwise. Nobody can say otherwise. We can put as much shame on each other as we want. In reality, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does with, with His servants, He's completely independent in His decisions. Jalla Jalalu. So we have our hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna Allah yaghfir dhunuba jami'a. Allah forgives all sins. And we'll look at a few ahadith that indicate this. And this is a very interesting one because it shows us, it's a little bit a subtle meaning, but it shows us that if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who was protected from sin and who was infallible, if he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness, then what about you or I? Just in case someone says, man, I'm so righteous, I don't need to ask Allah for forgiveness. No, 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 you never get there. The Prophet sallallahu would ask Allah for forgiveness. Why? Because it's an expression of ubudiyah. It's an expression of servitude. It's an expression of recognizing that we are in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, said in a hadith narrated by Imam al-Bukhari, Wallahi inni la astaghfirullaha wa atubu ilayhi fil yawmi akthara min sab'ina marra. He said, I swear by Allah that I seek Allah's forgiveness and I turn back to Him every day more than 70 times. More than 70 times. Why is that? Someone might be like, well, why? They say that, scholars say that one of the understandings of that is when the Prophet ﷺ would be given an even closer 
brought even closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in every moment and in every period of time, Allah would bring him even closer and his understanding and his taqwa and his khushur, his humility before Allah would increase, that he would seek Allah's forgiveness for the state that he was in before in comparison to what Allah had, had revealed to him in that moment. That's a little bit subtle, I don't want to get technical. But that's the, the depth of the relationship. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could bring him infinitely, infinitely closer because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is infinite and no created being can ever come to encompass all of the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's always, the Prophet ﷺ was always gaining deeper and deeper insights into the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, into his infinite perfection. So there are many ahadith. One of the most beautiful ahadith uh, that we hear about tawbah, that we hear about repentance, and you've heard it before, but it's worth repeating and worth reflecting upon, is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is well pleased and loves for His servants to seek forgiveness from Him. Someone might say to you that maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves for you to be perfect. And Allah loves for us to do good. That is what Allah wills for us. We don't say, you know what, I'm just going to mess up and keep asking for forgiveness. But that we are human beings and it's inevitable that we will make mistakes. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that moment when you say, you know what? I'm going to turn back to Allah. I'm going to make a change. Something's got to give. Whether it's in the words that I use or whether it's in the things that I look at or whether it's in the company that I keep or whether it's in what I allow to uh, enter my body of different different things that I'm going to make a change and I want to get right with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to come clean. I want to be clean. As the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ طَيِّبٌ لَا يَقْبَلُ إِلَّا طَيِّبًا Allah is pure and He only accepts that which is pure. So we have to purify our souls and we have to purify our slate so that when we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're granted eternal felicity. But the Prophet ﷺ says, Allahu afrahu bi tawbati abdihi. Allah is more well pleased with the repentance of his servant than someone who was in the desert. Now imagine this. Like if has anyone here ever been to like the desert desert, like in the middle of the desert? When you look around, you're like, if I was alone here, I'm not going anywhere. Like nobody's gonna find me. If you've seen like the deserts of Saudi Arabia or the, the empty quarter or the Gulf or anywhere else, like man, that's a lot of desert. So this man is in the desert and he's got his camel and the camel has all of his food and water and all of his belongings. And frankly, it's like his ride. Like he's not going to get back to where he needs to go without this camel in this, you know, hot desert. And the Prophet said him is drawing an analogy. It says, and then that man's camel just runs off all of a sudden. So it's like stuck in the middle of nowhere. And this isn't like, you know, they don't have cell phones. <laughs> there isn't like 911, come find me, here's my GPS coordinates. Nothing. You have nobody. So the camel runs off and the man just loses hope. He says, you know, I'm in the middle of the desert. I don't have water on a normal in normal climate, you could live for about three days without water. In the desert, good luck. You know, we fast these long days and by the end, I don't know about you all, but my lips are like super chapped and got to keep swallowing just to, to finish a sentence. In the middle of the desert, it's life or death. So the man digs a hole, the Prophet ﷺ tells us, and he lays down in the hole and just says, you know, I might as well prepare some sort of grave for myself and die comfortably. And he's accepted his death. He's accepted his fate. And he lies down and he falls asleep. And shortly thereafter, he feels something and he wakes up and he sees his camel has come back. Now, imagine, like literally, it's the difference between life and death. Like, I thought I was going to die. And you came back and now, alhamdulillah, I can live. That the man is so elated that he actually got tongue-tied. So the Prophet ﷺ tells us that he said, Oh Allah, you are my servant and I am your Lord. He meant to say it the other way around. Oh Allah, you are my Lord and I am your servant. And he meant to praise Allah, but he was so elated that he didn't even know what he was saying. He mixed it up. The Prophet said, Allah is even more pleased 
with his servant's repentance than that man when the camel came back. So we make mistakes. That's understandable. But we have to turn back. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not holding us to the criteria of perfection. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is holding us to the criteria. If you have life, then you still have an opportunity. Did you take that opportunity or not? And that is what tawbah is. And it brings a, a, a deeper connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it brings a great amount of blessings to one's life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to bestow His mercy upon us. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he was with the companions and they once saw a mother who was looking for her young son, young toddler. He was running around or crawling around. He was lost. And the mother is going around, where's my son? Where's my son? Where's my son? And then she picks up the baby and she holds the baby tight. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, do you think that this woman would throw her child in the fire? They said, no, O Messenger of Allah. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more compassionate towards his servants than this mother is towards her baby. But the thing is, my beloved brothers and sisters, we got to take the opportunity. If someone gives you a gift and you don't honor the gift, they'd be upset. Someone puts a lot of thought and effort and gives you something and you go, oh, thanks. Like this water bottle. Hassan gives me this water bottle. I just go, chuck it in the garbage. Hassan would be like, man, at least tell me you don't want it. You don't have to disrespect the gift. That's our life with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a gift. And if we don't take advantage of the opportunity, then we are rejecting the one who gave us that gift. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet ﷺ tells us in another hadith, which is really beautiful. And once again, it's this, it's this affirmation and confirmation of opportunity. One of the, the themes that I've been reflecting a lot upon in this month of Ramadan is just how many opportunities Allah is giving us. Constantly. Right? So another opportunity. عَنِ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ قَالْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى يَبْسُطُ يَدَهُ بِاللَّيْلِ لِيَتُوبَ مُسِيءُ النَّهَارِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extends His hand or extends His mercy in the night so that the person who sinned during the day can seek forgiveness. And this is an expression, a beautiful expression, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is extending His mercy. And what that means is that Allah is actively giving His mercy for those who are seeking it. Actively. So whoever m makes mistakes in the daytime, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extends His mercy in the night. So someone can say, Astaghfirullah, you know what? I shouldn't have done that today. I shouldn't have said that thing that I said about so-and-so. I shouldn't have backbit them. I shouldn't have yelled at that person. I shouldn't have looked at that thing. I shouldn't have done this or that or the other. And once again, you have to understand that the shaitan is intent on making you lose hope. Because the one serious rule in your life is that you turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you never stop. You never give up. Ever. Even if you have to crawl and you're broken, you turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the shaitan wants to say, you know what, go do something else with your life. You're never going to make it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is extending His mercy. Uh, and he extends his mercy in the daytime so that the person who sinned at night can seek forgiveness. Until the sun rises from the west. In other words, this happens every single day and night until the end of time. Every single day. It's not just Ramadan, it's not just Jum'ah. If someone sins, I say, you know what? I got to wait a few days. I have to wait for a really special occasion for Allah to forgive me. No. Instantaneously, you turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He forgives you. Scholars, there's an interesting narration that scholars discuss. I'm not quite certain of uh, uh, the strength of the narration, but it's interesting to think about where I've heard my teachers say that if you think about it, you have two angels, right? Raqib and Atid, as they're mentioned in the Qur'an. 
One of them writes down good deeds. One of them writes down sins. Who's in charge of the other? Which one is in charge? Yes. The one who writes down the good deeds is in charge. And you know what happens? There's a narration. It's an interesting narration. And once again, even in Fadail al-A'mal or even in uh, virtuous deeds, we can take some of the weaker ahadith. So he's in charge of the weaker one. And when a believer commits a sin, the one who writes down good deeds says to the other one, hold on just a little bit. Hold on. Maybe they'll make tawbah and you don't have to write it to begin with. And Allahu A'lam scholars talk about how long that is. That's beside the point. But once again, that the odds are in your favor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making mercy far more accessible than punishment. And at the end of the day, it's all in our uh, best interest. And it brings us benefit in this life and in the hereafter. If you look at people who've gone, uh, uh, I saw like some funny, you know, when you look at some article online, and then at the uh, bottom of the article, there's all these like really weird articles that are like, check this out, you know. Uh, uh, 20 people you didn't know were dead. So one time I clicked on it. It was 20, uh, you know, childhood movie stars who are dead. And these were people, you know, like, I don't want to age myself. These are, you know, movie stars when we were kids. Man, they have it all. You know, like, they got money, fame, everything. So many of them died from, from uh, uh, drug abuse. So many of them that you just thought, like, maybe they're not working in, in, in Hollywood or whatever anymore. They died. And you see this time and time again because when they have all that access and they actually don't know what's good for them or bad for them and what is bad is often hyped up and made to appear desirable, you start to realize that those people become very empty on the inside. Extremely empty. And I've met people like that. I remember, you know, I, I grew up in Saudi Arabia and a close friend of mine, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him, I really don't know where he is today, but he was a prince. Right? And as kids, it was like the funnest, his house was like the funnest place in the world. He had an indoor bowling alley in his house and a swimming pool. And he had everything. Like when video, the new video game systems came out, I don't even know what's out there anymore, but like the Nintendo, whatever, 64 or whatever came out. Like first day it came out, he had it. Every game that came out, he had it. I remember realizing over time that his life was very empty even though he was extremely wealthy and had everything that we thought we wanted, I remember that he barely ever saw his parents. He was raised by servants and maids. And that that kind of lifestyle just sometimes leaves you very empty inside. And that the greatest thing that will fill that void, as Ibn al-Qayyim al Josia says, he says that there is a hole in your heart that can only be filled with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's a sense of uh, being kind of forlorn or lost that can only be treated with feeling uh, serenity and nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that there is a part of your soul that will never find peace in these fleeting worldly things other than in turning back to its Lord and Creator and the cherisher Jalla Jalalu. And you see that you see that the Prophet ﷺ is encouraging us to take advantage of that. In another hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, he says, "Inna Allah Azza wa Jal yaqbalu tawbat al abdi ma lam yughargir." That Allah accepts the repentance of His servant as long as you know what yughargir is. Does anyone have a guess? What is yughargir? It's an Arabic word. You have a guess? When the, you know, when the, when the soul leaves the body, the person makes like a little bit of a sound. That's the gargara. That's what they call the gargara. When your soul leaves your body. At that point, the door closes. In other words, it's not something where people, oh my God, that's so intense. In other words, you have dozens and dozens of years to figure it out. But when that time comes, the exam is over. You got to put your pencils away. You got to close your books and you got to go forward with whatever you got. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying that Allah, 
But here's the beautiful thing. Allah accepts the repentance of His servant continuously throughout their lives until that moment. There's another really interesting story. You all might have heard of it before. Uh, uh, but there was a man that the Prophet ﷺ tells us about from previous generations. And this man really did some, uh, really did some terrible things. He killed 99 people. Now, if a person takes the soul of one other human being wrongfully, it is as if they've killed all of humanity. This man in previous times where you didn't have, you know, people would just drop a bomb and kill thousands of people or whatever, he killed 99 people individually face to face. So he wanted to turn back to Allah and ask Allah for forgiveness. Like this is like someone who you could say is like the head of like a cartel, just like a bad person. But then at one point in his life, we might say, man, you're done. You killed 99 people. There's 99 families that are praying day and night that you go to hell. Once again, I told you, human beings, we don't like to forgive each other. Understandably, when people are wrong. But that's something that we also have to work on. But anyway, he wanted to change. I'm, I'm done. Like, I really want to get right with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to come clean. Uh, this kind of lifestyle is not working out for me. So he asked around and they said, you know, come and talk to this, this monk-like man. This person just engages in worship and worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala day and night. But he wasn't someone who was very learned. Someone engaged in a lot of ibadah, but he didn't have a lot of knowledge. So he comes to this man and he says, you know what? I want to ask Allah for forgiveness. I want Allah to forgive me. So what have you done? That I've killed 99 people. It's like, 99 people? Nah, man, you're done. Like, forget about it. So then the man just gets really annoyed. They get into some sort of argument, and he takes the life of the monk, makes it an even hundred. Once again, he makes a mistake after he's trying to get right, he still makes a mistake. And that happens sometimes. Even in our path back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there might be a setback, there might be a slip up. But you have to keep going. You have to keep going. So uh, the man then goes to one of the scholars. The man then goes to one of the scholars. And this man had knowledge and so forth. Uh, so he said, I've killed a hundred people. And is there any chance that I can repent? So the scholar said, Naam, uman yahulu baynahu wa bayna tawbah. He said, who can get between him and repentance? Nobody. I don't care what anyone thinks. As long as you have life, you can ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. So then he told the man, he said, but you know what? You have to move somewhere else. Because this land that you live in, it has a bad influence on you. It's very interesting. Because I don't know about Canada, but in the United States, when someone is released from prison, they have to go for a certain while and go through parole and they have to live in the same place that they were living in when they committed the crime. And then a lot of people go back into crime because it's like the same old people saying, hey man, you're back, about to have fun again. Come with us, we're about to do this, we're about to do that. And the guy's like, F few weeks, he's like, nah, I can't do it, can't do it, can't get a job, can't make money. So he goes back into crime. But this scholar was very intelligent. And he said, you have to go somewhere else. This place, this environment is not a good environment for you. And it brings out the worst in you. And that's also a lesson for us. Alhamdulillah, I can pretty comfortably say, nobody here has killed 100 people, alhamdulillah. But one of the things that on a smaller scale is that when we're around bad company, even when we want to change, it's really difficult when you hang around the same people who might negatively influence you. It's just like, man, you know, and I remember when I was in university, I went through a really hard, uh, hard time because my friends were, were doing things that we, sh you know, shouldn't have been doing. And alhamdulillah, you know, m my parents uh, instilled the fear of God in me, which was really the fear of my parents, right? But it was just like, man, if my dad finds out, like, I'm dead, I can't do none of this stuff. And really, that was a, a blessing. And sometimes when you grow up, you're going to appreciate a lot of the things that your parents at the time, you're like, man, give me some room. 
to figure things out. But anyway, and I remember that I got into a big fight with one of my friends. And it was, it was I, don't, I don't need to get into details, they're unnecessary. But at that point, I remember it was one of the lowest times of my life. That it was my first year of university. I wasn't doing good in school because I was hanging out with my friends and wasting a whole bunch of time. There was a lot of things that uh, we all knew was wrong and we shouldn't have been doing. And when I was trying to convince them of that, you know, things got, went from bad to worse. So I kind of had a big fight with one of my friends and basically was alone most of the time. But when I was alone most of the time and I wasn't around this group of people who every single weekend wanted to do something that was not productive, I was able to say, man, what kind of person do I want to be? Where am I going with my life? Do I want to be an honorable person? Do I want to be someone where I can respect myself? Or do I want to just kind of like be a little kid as an adult for the rest of my life, hanging out with, with these guys who are up to no good? And alhamdulillah, because Allah removed me from that environment, you're able to see things clearly. So sometimes one of the most difficult things that you have to do is you have to recognize when certain friends and certain company and certain environments are toxic and you look for better people to be around, people who bring out good things in you. So this scholar told the man who killed a hundred people, you have to go to this other land where there's a lot of righteous people. You're going to be surrounded by good people. You're going to be surrounded by positive reinforcement. You're going to be surrounded by people who are going to encourage you to do good. So the man said, okay, I'll move there. So as he was traveling on this you know, journey to move to this other place, he died on the way. It's a very interesting hadith. He died on the way. So then the angel of paradise and the angel of hellfire come. And they said, well, what do we do with this guy? The angel of fire is like, he killed 100 people. Seems pretty clear to me. The other angel of paradise says, but you know, he's asking for forgiveness. And he was on his way to repenting. He didn't really, he wasn't able to get where he was going. And we didn't see the result of what he was going to do. But his intention was to make a change. And he was walking on that journey when he died. So then they said, okay, let us measure the distance between the city where he committed all of these crimes and the city of where he was going to repent. And whichever one he's closest to, well, if he's closer to the city where he killed 100 people, he's going to hell. If he's closer to the city where uh, he was going to repent, then we'll take him to paradise. Seems kind of random, right? Honestly, doesn't it seem a little bit random? Like, come on, either God is going to put him in paradise or God is going to put him in hell. It's not up to these angels. What's very interesting is that one of the narrations of the hadith narrates that he was closer to the city where he committed the crimes. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rolled up the earth and pushed him closer to the city where he was going to make tawbah. So the angels took him and take, took his soul to paradise. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making things easy for us. But what is on us is that we have to make an effort. We have to be uh, aware enough and mature enough and we have to care enough to really recognize what's good for us in the long term and what's good for us in this life and what's good for us in the hereafter. And we have to say, Oh Allah, I'm going to do my part. I'm going to try my best. I can't promise perfection. I can't promise that uh, uh, I'm going to do everything perfectly, but I am going to start and I'm never going to give up. And the Prophet ﷺ tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you take one step towards Allah, He takes two towards you. You come to Allah an arm's length, He comes to you a greater distance than that. And if you go to Allah walking, He comes to you at speed. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is generous. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants ease for us and does not want hardship. But we also have to recognize that He is the Lord of Majesty and when He sets boundaries, those boundaries need to be respected. And that is uh, ultimately uh, for our own good and benefit. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these blessed nights of Ramadan that He gives us a transformative tawbah. That it's not just the tawbah of the tongue but a tawbah of the heart. 
a tawbah that translates into actions, that our speech becomes more pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that what we look at is more pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that what we listen to is more pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that our character is improved and refined and elevated, and that we walk in the footsteps of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as uh, you know, one of my teachers was just reflecting upon earlier tonight, he said the entire legacy of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, can be encompassed in his character. The legacy that he left behind, the inheritance that he left behind, the glue that makes this whole deen make sense is his character sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa And that's not far-fetched because he said, إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ لِأُتَمِّمَ مَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم that I was sent only to perfect noble character and that one of the first and most important noble characteristics is that we are sincere with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that our hearts are in awe of Allah that our hearts are humble before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that we turn back and that we seek the strength that we need to change from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not from our own selves. And that we seek Allah's assistance in uh, opposing our own nufus and in opposing the shaitan. One of the scholars said, and I'll end with this. <clears throat> One of the scholars said that overcoming your nafs is like if you're going to visit a king and as you're in the courtyard of the king, this dog comes out and starts chasing you and barking at you and, and scaring you. And you're just trying to get around this dog. And you're trying to kind of like trick the dog. You're trying to get like some jerky. So you can go over there and you run the other way. You're trying to think of all these things to overcome this dog. Where the scholars, they say, the smart thing to do is to tell the king, hey, can you control your dog so I can come in? Take care of that dog for me. And the king will say, and the dog will be quiet. That is the same way with our nafs, with our lower self, that we seek assistance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who can overpower this nafs, even if we have a really difficult time controlling and overpowering this nafs, and that we follow in the footsteps of the most purified and the most beautiful uh, of creation, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. So inshallah we'll just end here and maybe have a few questions. والحمد لله رب العالمين سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك الحمد لله You're keeping me on track. Thank you very much. So I said at the very beginning that I would talk about the conditions of uh, repentance. And Jazakallah khair for asking that question. The question was <clears throat> about harming other people. And how our harming other people affects uh, our potential of being forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are three conditions or four conditions to repentance. The first condition is remorse. <clears throat> is remorse. Someone goes, man, I shouldn't have done that. That was the wrong thing to do. Right? So that's the first thing is that they feel bad about it. The second is that they intend never to do it again. So a person can't say, oh, you know what, I feel kind of bad about it, but tomorrow, tomorrow's Saturday night, Sunday, I'm going to ask Allah for forgiveness. It doesn't work like that. Right? A person says, I feel bad about it, I'm going to do my best never to do it again, starting from now. Even if at a later time they fall into it again, as long as they didn't sort of, you can't play with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can't trick Allah. But if you're sincere in the moment, inshallah Allah will forgive you. Uh, and then the, the, the third is to seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. The fourth, the fourth that they mention is redressing wrongs when the sin 
regards the rights of another human being. So let's say, for example, someone stole money. They owed someone money and they said, oh, no, no, no I gave you your money and whatever, they stole money. Something like that. Uh, then for their repentance to be sincere, they have to go back to that person and say, you know that money that I said that I already gave you, I recognize I didn't and I'm sorry. And I, here it is and I, I ask you your forgiveness. Right? Or even if someone harms another person, scholars say that's why one of the most dangerous things that you can do. Unfortunately, one of the easiest things to fall into, especially with social media, it was hard before, social media makes it worse. One of the most dangerous sins is backbiting. Because when you backbite someone, you are actually, uh, you are violating their right. And when you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness, that's beautiful and you should do that. But you still have to seek forgiveness from that person. And the reality is, is most people are not really willing to forgive. You said, what about me? No, I ain't going to forgive you. I already didn't like you that much to begin with. Right? So it's, you have to be very, very careful with backbiting. You have to be very careful with that. Um, so when you're, you know, or, or someone harms another person in any other kind of way, that they seek their forgiveness, that's one of the conditions. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put a great, Wait on the rights of other human beings. They say the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is quick to forgive. But the rights of other people, when you oppress and harm and violate their rights, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you have to figure it out. That's between you and them. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon us. And one of the things that we can do seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness is to forgive those who have wronged us. Because the reality is, is always a two-way street. We've wronged people. People have probably wronged us at some time in our lives. This Ramadan to say, Oh Allah, I forgive everyone who's wronged me and I ask you to forgive me. Now scholars say, if you repent and you either can't find the person that you've wronged or if you talk to them and say, Hey, you know, I used to backbite you and it's, uh, it's uh, what's it called? it's likely that they're just going to get more mad at you and not forgive you. That they say that you do some act of goodness and you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant the reward of that act towards the person that you harm. Whether it's charity or any other good deed, you say, Oh Allah, this is, or you make dua for them or something of that nature. Say, Oh Allah, this is me trying to compensate for harming them. Please accept it from me. <clears throat> We have a question here from the sister's side and then we'll, we'll swing back inshallah. The question is, how do we balance the fear of Allah with the hope in Allah? Meaning we know He subhanahu wa ta'ala is most merciful, but not to become complacent. That's a very good question. And the way that we try to balance that and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa encouraged us to have both hope and fear. To have both hope and fear. One of the things is that we recognize the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We recognize that Allah Jalla Jalalu is the owner of everything in creation, has ultimate and complete power over creation, and is completely deserving to be obeyed and never disobeyed. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He wills, He also uh, uh, treats his servants with justice and nobody can handle his justice. That's something that's a reality. The way that we balance that is that we remember to be mindful of the realities of the consequences of sins before we do those sins. So if someone is saying, hey, come out, we're going to go do this and that and the other and you know in your heart of hearts this isn't where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you. You start to be like, well, what if this is the last thing I do? What if this is the thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds me accountable for? What if something bad happens to me while doing this bad thing? What if? So you, you instill that healthy sense of fear that is preventative between you and the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when someone on the other hand is like, ah, oh, you know, I did all of these bad things and I want to change. And I just, I don't think Allah is going to forgive me. You say, no, no, that's the wrong sense of fear. That's an incorrect 
uh, uh, fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. So they say the sign of the proper fear of Allah is that it restrains you from sins. And the sign of proper hope in Allah is that it makes you encouraged to do good things. So it's not that, oh, you know, Allah is merciful, cool, whatever. I'm just going to sit here and do nothing. Allah is merciful. Like, inshallah, you'll forgive me. You're most merciful. And you just keep doing, no, no, it's almost Allah is merciful. That Allah grants this reward. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, grants his repentance to those who seek it. And you see, all of these things are conditional. I'm going to get to work. And then your nafs tries to call you to do something bad. Ah, astaghfirullah. Man, I can't take the full power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I can't handle the justice. I can't handle the punishment. So I'm not even, I'm not even going to get close to it. So that's something that, uh, a way that we balance. And I hope that that's a helpful answer. How many more questions should we take? Okay. About 50 minutes. So that brother had his hand up first and then we'll come to you. Yes. Sure, okay, bismillah. <clears throat> No. Mm. Ah, that's a that's a very good question, mashallah. I'm glad you're thinking. So the question is about the verse that we quoted at the beginning, uh, uh, saying, "Seek Allah's forgiveness, then turn back to Him." The difference between istighfar and tawbah. And there is a slight difference. So istighfar is a word where you say astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Many of us are familiar with it. Uh, it. It literally means it's a verb form that is astaf'ala, which means to seek something. So when you do astaghfir, I am seeking your maghfirah, ghafara, your forgiveness. So it is a verbal statement that you're seeking Allah's forgiveness. Thumma tubu ilay, tawba is less of a verbal or physical thing and more of an action of the heart. That your heart, when you disobey Allah, it's all, it's not about physical things, right? When you disobey Allah, you're turning away. But then you say, you know what? I got to turn back. Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. Oh Allah, I'm turning back to you. I'm going to do better. I'm going to change some things. I want your pleasure. I want your reward. I want nearness to you. I want paradise. I want all of these beautiful things that you are granting your righteous servants. That's a part of Tawbah. Mm, good question. Yes, back. Like, sure. That's a very good question. So if you hurt someone before but you cannot face them, uh, it really depends. I mean, there's like a multitude of scenarios that come to mind from something like that. But it goes back to if you cannot, or maybe in some cases, you really should not be communicating uh, with, with someone that maybe you heard in the past. Then one of the things that you do is really make a lot of dua for that person. And, uh, uh, you know, if you're able to do some act of righteousness, charity or anything like that, uh, that you grant the reward uh, to that person. And if there's ever a time even down the line in the future where it would be possible and or appropriate to mention to that person, even indirectly, even in the form of an email or something like that, once again, uh, uh, the opportunity and uh, whether it is appropriate to say, you know, I feel uh, very bad about this, that and the other, and uh, I really seek your forgiveness or something to that effect, uh, then that would be good, right? Because sometimes in the immediate is very difficult, but uh, a person starts with their dua and their sincere turning back to Allah and recognizing that they should never harm another human being in that way. And then if the opportunity arises even uh, years down the line to bring it up with that person, even if it's in an indirect way, or even if there's, you know, a family member or a friend of that person to say, you know, I hurt your sibling, so please, uh, you know, let them know that I feel very bad about that and I seek their forgiveness. And alhamdulillah, one of the, the things with time is for a lot of people, not everyone, for some people time only makes things worse, but most people want to let things go. And most people recognize that 
uh, uh, the way that they seek Allah's forgiveness is in forgiving others. So inshallah that opportunity will arise. And in a lot of cases, we might not ever have the chance to apologize to the person. So we just really, really beg for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's complete and encompassing forgiveness. Yeah. Any questions from the sister's side? La ilaha illallah. Okay, mashallah. No pressure. Nobody's got to... There's one more question here. Yes. Alaykum salam. Yes, mashallah. So in the case of unforgivable sins like shirk, even that is if a person dies upon it. Right? And alhamdulillah, if you're here at 2 a.m. in Ramadan, I don't think shirk applies to anyone here. It doesn't apply to any of the believers, alhamdulillah. Um, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a sahih hadith that I do not fear shirk for my ummah. So I'm not going to busy myself with what he was not worried about for his ummah. Whoever has la ilaha illallah, shirk is folly. Uh, but that's obviously an unforgivable sin, but it doesn't apply to Muslims anyway. Uh, and, you know, obviously one would stay away from that. And it's pretty straightforward, I guess. Is there, is there something like in specific? Yeah, yeah. If a person dies in, in that state or even a state of disbelief, I mean, obviously that's, that's uh, unforgivable. But if a person becomes Muslim or, or changes their ways, all of the Sahaba at some point became Muslim, right? So, and they're the best of people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from disbelief and from associating partners with Him and from anything that brings uh, His displeasure. Ameen. Yes, we have a question. Um, it's a very good question. So the question is about riya, which is showing off or ostentation. And seeking a place in other people's hearts through acts of worship that, that uh, should only be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how do we avoid that? It's uh, one of the most treacherous of the diseases of the heart, one of the most difficult to overcome in its entirety. But one of the things that's very important is that uh, we should first and foremost implement anything that we are trying to convey or anything that we are learning within our own selves. Uh, and when we do that successfully, uh, then we are more capable of conveying that to other people with more sincerity. Uh, and another thing that, that scholars mention is even if a person is involved in the community or praying in the mosque or doing things that are generally done publicly, that they should definitely have a private uh, worship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That they should have some deeds that nobody knows about. So, you know, I'm going to bed, you know, good night, mom and dad, whatever, close the door, pray two rakahs. Read a little bit of Qur'an, do some dhikr that nobody ever needs to know about. Uh, and that's one of the ways that you are able to cultivate that sincerity and know in your heart and in your mind that ultimately nobody can benefit or harm other than Allah, that everyone else is in the same boat. Nobody, even if everyone in the world thought that you were amazing and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not accepted you, they can't do anything for you. And if everyone thought that you were a bum, but you were had a place with Allah, you have a place with Allah. And there are many people like that. There were even Sahaba who people thought very little of. But the Prophet ﷺ said, they have a very special place with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So really working on that sincerity and working on ourselves first and foremost, and then helping others, uh, which is a very great and important responsibility. And then secondly, having some act of worship that is purely a secret between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu a'lam. There was another question here? Yes. Ah. 
That's a good question. So someone said, if what, what's the case of someone who's asking for forgiveness, but in the back of their mind, it might happen again, just based on circumstances and friends and environment. And, you know, uh, uh, it might just come up again, likely. So what someone should do in, in that situation is really think deeply and hard about if uh, uh, people they respected saw them in that state or saw them in that company. And if they feel a sense of shame around that, then they should recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is even more aware of them. And one of the things that's actually the most, uh, one of the things that's the most valuable in your own life is actually respecting yourself. And the way that, that you are able to achieve that is not giving in to your environment or even to your friends. Honestly, one of the most difficult things, and I know because a lot of people tell me like, that's really, really hard and I, I totally empathize. But one of the most important things that we have to do, the Prophet ﷺ said, المرء على دين خليله. A person is upon the religion of their close friend. So if I am a nobody, but I try to keep the company of someone who I would see all the signs of goodness and belovedness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their character, their worship, their following in the footsteps of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So you know what? I'm going to be around you. I'm going to tag along. Then even if I'm not as good as that person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold me in the same level as them. And if you're around people who are worse than you, it's like they're my friend. And that's where I was when I was in the university. Like, man, these are my friends. Like we were literally like friends since childhood. And I had grown up overseas and I was like, man, I'm going to come back and hang out with my friends. And it's going to be, you know, all of the time that we lost, we're going to make up for it. Uh, and I was like, I don't have other friends. Like these are the people I grew up with. And then it just came to a point where it's like, it's really toxic. And absolutely that. If I keep hanging with them, things are just going to get progressively worse and worse and worse. And the stuff that I didn't like, but I was around, it's a matter of time before it's like, you know what? I'll get involved in it too. So if a person is really serious, now on a simple level, a person says, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. I don't want to do that. Ya Allah, I feel bad. I don't want to do that again. I don't know if it's going to happen or not, but I really don't want to. Inshallah, that's a very good sign. But if a person is serious, happens two, three, five, ten, twenty times, you go, you know what? It's not going to change until I make a major change. So at that point, you have to really think, um, you have to think really uh, seriously and deeply about that. Uh, and, and, and once again, that's what Toba is. Toba is like something's got to give. Something's got to change. Uh, and that change at first is not always uncomfortable. It can, is not always comfortable. It can be intimidating. It can be scary. It can be life changing. But, uh, it's necessary. At some level, it's necessary. We'll take this last question and then inshallah wrap up. Uh, someone wrote here, I've heard that Allah will show a video of the sins of a person. Will He show it to everyone even if He forgives? There's a beautiful hadith in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring the servant close on the day of resurrection. And uh, that person will see their, whether it's a video or whether it's a 3D image, whether, that's all details. But a person will see all the things that they've done. And the person will feel shame before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah will say, just as I veiled you from people in the world, I will veil you from them on the day of resurrection and I forgive you. There was a time, uh, a man in the time of Prophet Musa alayhi salam, who, uh, who was sinful. I believe he either was uh, backbiting or he cut off one of his family members. I can't remember the exact sin. But he was engaging in some sin and there was a drought. It wasn't raining. So the people came to, to Prophet Musa and said, ask Allah what's going on, why the rains are not coming down. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, there's a man among your people who is committing this sin. Because of that, I'm withholding the rain. So Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he went out and he said, people, Allah has told me that someone is committing this kind of sin. Turn back to Allah in repentance and ask for his forgiveness. Shortly thereafter began to rain. 
So then Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he said, Oh Allah, who was the man? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I veiled him when he was sinning. Do you think I'm going to expose him now that he has repented? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful. And we ask Allah to cover our sins in this life and the hereafter. There will be people who will be exposed. But, uh, you know, it's not for me to say who those people are or, or who they aren't. But we ask Allah for uh, His all-encompassing mercy and that He treats us with His forgiveness and that there are some people who will be entered into paradise without even a judgment. Just, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we're of those. Ya Arham Ar-Rahimeen, Ya Arham Ar-Rahimeen, Ya Arham Ar-Rahimeen, Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala sahbihi ajma'in. see a couple people yawning. People saying, man, I got to get some suhoor in. It's going to be a long day tomorrow. So jazakumullah kul khair. I'm very honored to be here. Allah reward all of you and bless all of you and your families and your parents and your children. Uh, and please uh, remember uh, me and my family and your duas in this blessed month of Ramadan. And may Allah make this Ramadan and the ummahs turning back to him a source of alleviation for the rest of the ummah and that everyone is protected and everyone is given peace and stability and safety. Ya Arhamar Rahimeen. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.